So um, my name is Lauren. I'm here with Child Care Answers. Um, and before I do a little bit more of an introduction of myself, I do want to let you know, um, and you may have accessed our information from social media already, um, but we are very active and we've been building out our social media even more during um, quarantine. So you can find more workshop opportunities and parent parenting tips online. You can visit us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, also on our website, which I will type in the chat box a little bit later. Um, but if you just go to our website and then go backslash your child, there are tons and tons and tons of parenting tips. We're constantly adding to them. So there are things specifically for infant feeding, infant sleep, safe sleep materials, um, breastfeeding materials. I am a lactation consultant as well. Um, and then information on cloth diapering, if you choose to do that too. Great information also for childcare providers. If you're not aware of cloth diapering, if you've never done it before and then you have a new family enter your program that does use them, it gives you a little bit of information on kind of how to handle them in childcare, but also what parents are doing with them at home. And then a little bit about me. Um, here's a picture of me since my video is off right now because no one wants to watch me while I'm talking with my hands um, as I'm giving this presentation. But I will turn my video on at the end so that you can ask questions and we can have more of a conversation. Um, but again, my name is Lauren. I am the Family Support Specialist with Child Care Answers. So in that role, I provide parenting workshops and parenting tips. I also do one-on-one -on -one consultations with families. So if there is something specific that you want to address to say, hey, this information was great, but like you don't know my baby, let's talk about this scenario, completely free of charge. We can either meet via Zoom or just exchange emails back and forth or chat via the phone. Um, and then anything really infant infant toddler related, behavior related, or um, special needs related, I'm your gal. Um, if I do not have the answers, I will connect you with someone who does. Um, in my previous role with Child Care Answers, I spent 10 years as the infant toddler specialist. So I have a lot of background in our youngest ones. I also have two kiddos of my own. I have a two and a half year old and a son who just turned seven. So I have a little girl and a little boy. Um, so I will typically in these sessions provide a little background by having conversations and sharing stories about when my kiddos were little too. Because I'm almost out of that toddler phase, which is really sad. So I would love to hear more about you. Um, so you already told me how old your kiddos are or what role you play in a kiddo's life. Now I'm going to pull up our poll, <laughs> pull our poll. And this will let me know what county you reside in. Um, this is important for us because we do cover Hamilton, Marion, and Hendricks counties, but these sessions are being shared across the entire state. Um, so I like to know if you are part of our area or outside of our area, um, what county you reside in, and then at the end I'll show you a map, um, our statewide map to let you know who those contacts are around the state that can support you. And I'd be happy to start the conversation and get you some resources and then connect you with your local agency as well. So just because you might not live in Hamilton, Marion, or Hendricks doesn't mean that I'm not accessible to help you and answer some of your questions. We all work together. Um, we meet bi-weekly so that we are all on the same page sharing the same messaging and we can have those conversations as well. Awesome, wonderful. Thank you for that. All right, so as we talk about babies and parenting, um, I think it's important that we all have some shared agreements or that we're all on the same page about a couple of things. Um, number one is that a routine is not a schedule. Um, I think it's important as we talk about these feeding and sleep routines that we're talking about a routine, which is a set of things that happen in the same order and not a schedule or a time schedule. Um, so we don't want to get our baby on a schedule. We want to get them on a solid routine so that they know what's coming, but that routine is very flexible. Um, and I'll share more about what a routine looks like. 
but some other examples outside of feeding or sleep are taking baby for a walk about the same time every day, um, establishing certain patterns. So maybe in your bath routine, you always wash baby the same way. Um, maybe when you're playing, you do some of the same activities every single time. Um, you read the same couple of books every single time. So those are things called a routine, not a schedule. Um, it allows our baby to understand a little bit about predictability and a little bit about how their day is going to go. Um, and everyone thrives in predictability, including babies. The second shared agreement is that you know your baby the best. So I might share some tips and you're like, yeah, that's not going to work for my baby. Um, I know my baby and I know what works best for them. Um, I have two kiddos, and while they have some similarities, they were two very different babies, and so their needs were very different. Um, my daughter, my second, she was very easy at transitioning. She transitioned from the swaddle super easy. She transitioned from my room and into her room super easy. She transitioned from breast to bottle to no bottle very easily. So I know when it comes time to take her pacifier away, it's going to be a pretty easy transition. Um, I know hopefully when we move to a toddler bed that that's going to be an easy transition. With my son, he struggled with transitions and he still does at seven years old. And he'll even say like, I don't want to move on to something else. Um, and I know it's not that he doesn't want to do what comes next. He doesn't want to stop what he is doing to transition on to something else. So transitions have still been really difficult and switching things up has been difficult for him. So he was the baby that we rocked or nursed to sleep. And then we had to army crawl out of the room to not wake him. He was the baby that we had to put a door lock on the inside of his door when we transitioned to a toddler bed because he kept trying to escape. Um, I had to buy lots of wine during that time frame. So I have a little bit of PTSD coming into transitioning my, to to my toddler out of her crib, um, but I know she's a different baby, so I know things will look different, but it's still a little PTSD there. Um, he was also really difficult to transition out of a swaddle, and every milestone that he hit in the first year disrupted his sleep. But overall, both of my kids were fairly good sleepers given all of that because we had a super, 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 super strong routine from the very, very beginning. So at just a couple weeks old, we were doing bath every day. Our nighttime routine was the same and we were consistently offering an early bedtime. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but given all of that, both of my kiddos were fairly good sleepers, especially as I relate my sleep to my friends and families and their babies, um, I, I got pretty lucky given all of that. Um, and I can also assure you that there are no bad babies. So even if right now your baby is not sleeping or if you're frustrated, there are no good or bad babies. Um, every baby is a fantastic baby. So asking like, do you have a good sleeper? Or you have a good baby implies that there are some babies who are bad. Um, and I've never met a baby who wasn't amazing, even one that cried a lot and didn't sleep very well. And I was all, also an infant teacher, so I cared for eight babies at the same time, and there are no bad babies. Also, all parents want what is best for their baby. Um, everyone is doing the best they can with the tools they've been given. Some of us have a ton of tools in our tool belt from our past experiences and others don't have as many. So ideally this workshop is to help build your toolbox. Um, and again, every baby is different. So a tool that works for one is not gonna work for another one. Um, and at the end of the day, I am available for a free one-on-one -on -one consultation. I can talk to you as much as I need to um, for you to really feel confident about your baby and about parenting and to answer any of your questions. Additionally, this training is not about providing parental guilt. I am not going to encourage cry it out and I'm not going to shame you on nursing your baby to sleep. You do you. Um, I have never met a child who didn't go off to kindergarten not sleeping through the night because they were nursed to sleep as a baby. Um, your child will learn to sleep 
if you choose to nurse them. They're only a baby for a short period of time, so we're not getting into the shame game or creating parental guilt here. I'm also not encouraging you to put your baby in a room for a half an hour and let them scream until they fall, them, fall asleep. If that cry it out method works for your baby, then go for it. If you don't believe in cry it out, then don't by any means try it. Um, it is 100% your decision and you need to feel confident in that decision. What we are gonna talk about today are some tips that can help you establish a great routine with your baby and you feel more confident as a parent. Um, and these tips are to help life get a little bit easier for all of you. Whether you're in a classroom managing eight babies or whether you're at home with your one, maybe two, three babies, um, these are all tips to just help you all be more successful and for your baby to be more successful. So number one is to teach your baby the difference between night and day. So as babies are born, they don't know the difference between night and day. Um, which is probably why they're kicking, kicking, kicking when you're trying to go to sleep at night, right? Um, so when a baby is born, they're still learning all of this. And they quite often mix it up. They're wanting to sleep all day and stay awake and party all night, and you're just not into that. Um, so you may find that your baby is wanting to nap all day long and then perk up at night. So helping them learn the difference between day and night can be really, really important in establishing a good routine. And you can do this um, by changing your baby's clothes in the morning and at night. So when they wake up, you put a fresh set of clothes on them. When it's time for bed, you do a bath and put them in their jammies so that they know that that fresh set of clothes means that there's a change coming. Um, so there's a change in the morning, it's time to wake up, and at night it's time to go to sleep. Also setting a daytime and nighttime mood in the house. So during the day, it's turning on lights, it's making noise. Um, even during nap time, we don't wanna make a ton of noise, but it's okay to make some noise during nap time. Um, sound machines and things like that work great to drown out any really loud background noise. Um, at nighttime, it's dimming the lights, it's being quiet. Um, in the middle of the, those night feeds, it's talking to our baby as little as possible um, so that they know that right now, it's, this is just time to eat and go right back to bed. This is not awake time. So a daytime feed and a nighttime feed should look different. So those are all ways to help. Um, and essentially, like during the day, we're playing a lot with our babies. And um, when it's not feeding time, it's not sleep time, um, that we're playing with them and we're stimulating them and we're talking to them. Um, we're doing a lot of tummy time and floor time. Um, because if our baby is not eating or sleeping or in our arms, the best place for them is to be on the floor working on those large muscle movements, learning to lift up their head and to roll over and to do all of those things that babies need to learn. And on the floor is the best place for that to happen. And they learn very quickly that that's what I do during the day. And at night, I don't get any of that. Even if I'm awake at night, they're not playing with me. They're not singing with me. They're not reading books with me. They're not talking to me because this time is different. This is nighttime and I'm supposed to be asleep or I'm supposed to be calm right now. The second tip um, is to introduce a bedtime routine early on. Um, so you can, you can start establishing a pretty predictable routine once your baby hits about two months old. Um, so this teaches our baby to go to sleep at the same time each night. Um, although it may take them a little while to catch on, they begin to learn like, oh, these are all of the things that I do before it's time for me to go to sleep at night. We wanna limit our nighttime routine to about 20 or 30 minutes because then if it's any longer than that, they get a little overstimulated and we have to kind of start over again. Um, but a great simple bedtime routine, and I did this routine starting at just a few weeks old with my babies. Um, so probably before I even went back to work on maternity leave, uh, a bath every night. Um, you may not want to use soap every night and that's your prerogative with your baby. 
Um, but if you're getting a great baby shampoo or a baby soap, it does not dry out the skin. If your baby has eczema, nightly baths actually help the eczema better than um, limiting baths. And I know from experience, because I have two babies with eczema, I also have eczema. And the longer I go between a bath or a shower, the worse my eczema gets and not better. So do a bath a massage with oil or lotion um, and then putting on the PJs really helps kind of calm baby and get them ready into that sleep routine. Read a book together. Um, yes, your newborns need to be read to. Um, nurse or bottle feed your baby and then lay them down and say night night. Um, whether you're choosing to lay them down when they're a little bit drowsy and zoning out or whether you choose to nurse them to sleep and then lay them down, you do you. Um, both babies as toddlers and preschoolers and kindergartners and college students will fall asleep on their own. They don't need to be nursed to sleep in college, so you do you. Um, but of letting them know that now it's time to go to sleep. Number three is to learn to read your baby's cues. Uh, and sometimes this can be challenging. We may not always be very in tune. We might have a different temperament than our baby or our child. And it may, hard, may be hard sometimes to read cues. Um, the good news is we're only in sync with our children about 40% of the time. So this does not mean that you have to be 100% in sync with your baby all the time. It's never going to happen. There's going to be ebbs and flow. It's like dancing with a new dance partner. At times we're really in sync and we have this great movement and we're kind of reading each other. And at other times we're stepping on each other's toes and we're falling over. And that's what happens when we learn to get along and get to know each other. We're getting to know our babies and they're getting to know us. Um, so during this process of getting to know each other, we're learning their cues and they're learning ours. For my two on here that are classroom teachers, we're learning eight babies' cues. And they're learning our cues. And that's where things like primary caregiving are really, really important because then I'm really er only learning the cues of four babies instead of eight. And I'm sharing those responsibilities with my co-teacher. But also the more in tune we are with our babies, the more that we're aware of what they need. Um, and when we are meeting a need, we feel confident as a parent and our baby is feeling great and confident as a baby because they've been given what they need. Uh, so we want to really allow baby to guide the routine by reading kind of those cues and learning what they need. Um, so try kind of making note when baby gets tired, hungry, or is ready to play and what that looks like in your baby and the signs or signals that they're giving you to say, oh, yeah, when my baby does this, this is what that means. Um, record it, write it down if you need to, take a picture of it, um, because it does take a little bit of time to get in sync with your baby. And um, here are some benefits outside of just being a more confident parent that helps when we're understanding our baby's cues. So when we, reading our baby's cues and we're responding promptly and appropriately, our babies are relaxing. So if we're misreading a cue and we're constantly trying to feed our baby, but the cue that our baby is giving us is that they're overstimulated or tired, then we're having mixed messaging and our baby isn't able to relax. But as soon as we shift and say, oh, my baby's not hungry, my baby's tired, and then I switch from trying to feed to trying to soothe, my baby relaxes because they're getting their need met, but they're also realizing, oh, you get me, and um, you know what I need. It, we do this with our partners as well. <laughs> and it helps you to learn what response they prefer so when you do X, I offer Y, and that works. Um, every baby likes to be rocked in a different way, soothed in a different way, fed in a different way. And so when we learn that you're giving me this cue and then I hold you on my shoulder and it helps you, we're learning what response our baby prefers. It also helps your baby build trust. Um, and if we know what our baby needs and our, know what our baby wants and we're providing that, 
then our baby learns that you're someone I can rely on. And when I have a need, you'll meet that need. It also teaches them about emotions um, because there are going to be times in all of this that we're gonna get frustrated. And there's also going to be times that we're going to be happy and we're gonna be sad and we're gonna be mad. And they're learning about those emotions from reading our emotions. It also helps us feel more confident, like I mentioned, and it allows you and your baby to kind of be in tune or in sync, um, kind of going through life in this beautiful dance. Um, and again, we're only in this beautiful dance about 40% of the time. So there's going to be a lot of times that I'm like, I don't know what you need right now and I need to walk away. And then I'm going to come back and we might get back in sync after that. I'm even out of sync 60% of the time with my seven-year-old. Um, but a seven-year-old can kind of tell you a little bit more about what they need than a baby does. Um, but their needs are also a little bit more complex than a baby. <laughs> so you don't need a baby to vocalize. You can usually tell um, what babies need. So when babies um, are needing something, uh, they're usually in about six different states. Um, so this deep sleep is a state that our babies are in, and that tells you just to let me sleep, right? When our baby is in, in, our deep, in a deep sleep, um, we don't mess with them. We don't wake a sleeping baby in a deep sleep. So their eyes are closed, they're still, their breathing is regular, they may startle occasionally, um, but they're good, they're chilling. <clears throat> and then we have this baby in light sleep. It's also known as rapid eye movement or REM sleep. Their eyes will be closed, but they may open briefly. They're moving a little bit or startling. They might make some occasional suckling motions. Um, this baby is smiling in their sleep. And these are things that let you know that baby is in the process of waking. And this is a really great time if it's time for a baby's feed, especially a newborn that we're waking and we're starting a feed at this time. REM sleep is the perfect time to initiate the waking for a feed. And then you have drowsy. So drowsy is typically that process of going to sleep where they're semi-dozing, they're not fully asleep, but they're nearly there. Their eyes may open and shut. Um, they may have some movements, but they're really, really like smooth. They're yawning. Um, this lets us know that we need to remove stimulation and help our baby continue to fall asleep. This may also be the time that you want to initiate laying your baby down awake to see if they can fall asleep on their own, but some babies can and some babies can't. And then we have our awake um, state. So we have our alert, alert state, which is basically I'm awake, I'm focused in on something, but I'm pretty still, I'm not moving around, I'm just kind of like staring at something. Um, active and alert is that I'm awake, but I'm moving. I'm trying to get your attention, I'm making sounds, I'm moving around. Um, this is the time when I'm saying, I want you to play with me. I want you to sing me a song, I want you to read me a book, I want you to tickle me, like I'm ready for that, so that's what I want you to do right now. Alert is, I'm probably going to get active and alert soon, but I need you to really ease in to play with me. Active and alert is like, I am down for this. And then we have crying. So crying is our fussy state. They may squirm, they're difficult to soothe. And this is when you really need to have the tools on soothing um, because a crying baby is telling you something or they have already told you something and you've missed it. Um, so these are the times to introduce swaddling, shushing, bouncing, patting, um, helping our baby calm before then we can allow them to enter one of these other states. In addition to the states, there's also cues or clues that our babies give us that let us know that it's time to eat or that they're hungry. So some really early hunger cues are stirring, during that REM sleep, I'm starting to wake up, I'm starting to move around, I might start moaning a little bit, um, I'm opening my mouth and possibly doing some suckling with my mouth, um, and then I'm turning my head and rooting, typically rooting to the breast. Even a bottle-fed baby will root to the breast. 
these are all early clues to say, hey, I'm hungry. And so if we feed our baby in these early cues, that's fantastic. We are super in tune and we know from those tiny movements that our baby is hungry. The mid cues, which is a, a little bit more obvious cues that mean I'm really hungry are that I'm stretching, I'm increasing my movements, I might bring my hand or fist to my mouth and really suck or go to town on my fist. I'm telling you like, I'm really hungry, feed me, feed me, feed me. And then if we're not getting the, the clue yet, our late cues come in. And these are things that say, I'm really upset and you need to call me first and then you need to feed me. So they're crying, they're agitated, um, they might start turning red. These are things that we then have to calm before we can feed. So we've missed some cues. Um, so crying, being an old wives tale that babies cry when they tell you when they're hungry. They do, they cry when they tell you that they're really, really hungry. They've told you some other things before they get to the point of crying to communicate hunger or crying to communicate sleep. And then our sleep cues are very similar. They're doing things to let you know I'm tired, I'm really tired or I'm overtired. So our tired cues is the stare. They just kind of zone out. And oftentimes as a parent or a caregiver, we misread this cue for, I need to change up the way that I'm playing with you. Okay, you're getting bored of this, I need to introduce something new. Um, and instead what this cue is really telling you is that I'm tired and I'm ready for sleep. So regardless of what you try to entertain me with, it's not going to work or not going to work in the long term. And if you're misreading this and you're continuing to try to stimulate me, then I might go into overtired pretty quickly. They also get kind of this flushing of the skin or these pink brows, these pink cheeks that let you know like, okay, I'm tired. Um, and then they kind of look away or disengage eye contact with you. The I'm ready for nap, lay me down as they start to get a little squirmy, a little fussy. They have a lot of big yawns and they're beginning to do the eye rubs. These are the things that we typically associate with sleep. So oftentimes, this is where we read the sleep cue. We don't really get it in the early stages. But this is where we really see it. Um, and then the I'm overtired. I'm screaming. I'm very agitated. I'm very rigid in my body. You're holding me and I kind of pull off of you or I push away. Um, this is the I am so tired, but now I can't go to sleep because I'm mad. So but in the earlier, the feeding cues, we had hanger. Um, this is like the equivalent of hanger of like when we're staying up way too late, even though we retired three hours ago and now we can't fall asleep. This is a similar thing to a baby. So they need to be calmed um, before we can even try to soothe them to sleep. So those all really help you understand your baby's needs and get on the same page with baby. Um, I really like to print those out so that I can be like, okay, you're making kind of this movement or this. Let me go check the cue list. Okay, that's what you're trying to tell me. Um, and there's a lot of different cues, but very quickly, you just know them. You can tell immediately what your baby needs. You don't need to look at a picture, cross-reference, and be like, okay, my baby's doing this. What does that mean? Um, very early on, you learn how to do that naturally. Um, the fourth um, tip is to put your baby's routine first. Um, it's best to keep a routine as consistent as possible, especially when they're still getting used to it, which all babies are just still getting used to things. So making the routine the number one priority can help them understand that certain things happen at particular times. Um, a routine may also help you keep a focus in order to the day amid the chaos and constant feeds and diaper changes, um, which I know can be very overwhelming. So of course, like it's busy, things happen, um, but we want to make sure to limit disruptions as much as possible. So it's okay if you're going out to the store in the middle of nap today, but don't make it a consistent routine. Uh, make sure that the routine comes first. This may mean having to move around play dates or change plans or say, hey, we can't come over for this right now. 
um, which during COVID is kind of nice because you can use COVID as the excuse for a lot of this. Um, but I know as a parent how disruptive it is when my husband's family always wants to get together for what they call dinner at 1 p.m. Um, and that is super disruptive to nap. It works for a baby who is in like the nine and two nap schedule. And that's kind of it. It doesn't work for a toddler. It doesn't work for a baby who's sleeping more consistently. Um, you would think that after eight years of having grandchildren, you would understand, but I guess not. But hey, you win some, you lose some. So sometimes we just have to suck it up. Um, and I know if on a Sunday we're going to their house and having a one o'clock meal, then on Saturday, I have to make nap the priority. I cannot skip nap on Saturday and Sunday or we're all going to be a wreck. Um, and I also know that there's times that I have to say, no, we can't. Can we do 10 o'clock like a brunch or can we do a later lunch because that's in the middle of nap time? And it's okay to put that routine first. The fifth tip is to expect changes during growth spurts and milestones. Your baby is going to grow so much in the first year. It's kind of amazing how much they grow and learn their brain at birth is 25% of their adult brain and by age one it's 75%. Over the next 25 years they're going to fine-tune that other 25% of their brain. There is so much that happens in the first year and it's an amazing year to go through with your baby um, but with changes comes disruption. Disruptions in sleep and eating. Um, so expect that. So here is kind of an example of a feeding timeline in the first year, just to show how much changes just with the way your baby eats from the time they're born to their first birthday. So a baby from birth to six months pretty consistently is just drinking milk, very easy. Um, they may lessen the amount of feeds in a day because they're increasing the amount of ounces or they become more efficient at the breast, but for the first six months, they're just eating milk and that's great. Around six months we introduce solids and then that kind of can complicate things but let's try not to let it complicate us because we're going to be prepared for these milestones. So at six months we're going to start a puree once a day, very casually increase those as they get a little bit older. We're going to encourage them to self-feed. That may mean holding a spoon while we're spoon feeding may dip their food in some foods. Um, as they're getting a little bit older, it's offering some finger foods. And by eight months, we've really transitioned from purees to finger foods. And then by 12 months, we've really transitioned to this baby eating all table foods. They're self-feeding, they're making a mess. That's okay, that's how they learn. Um, and then if the baby is formula fed, they're transitioning to whole milk. And if they're breastfed, they're either continuing to breastfeed or they're transitioning to whole milk as well. And then by 18 months, we have this pretty independent eater who's eating the three meals, two snacks a day. They're using utensils. They're drinking from a sippy cup. Um, they're pretty independent. They're still making a mess, but they're doing really, really well. This also helps us understand, you know, about six months when we introduce solids, I need to start a sippy cup. Um, get a little bit of water in there. The goal is really to teach them how to drink from the sippy and not for them to drink very much from it. So by the time they are 12 to 18 months, they know how to use the sippy, no problem. We don't wanna wait until 12 months to introduce the sippy because then we have a huge barrier of transitioning milk to the sippy, but also transitioning away from the bottle or breast at the same time if we're choosing to stop nursing. We also wanna introduce utensils from the very beginning so that they're learning that a utensil isn't something that we just hold, they get to hold it and utilize it as well. Um, so this is just one example of how things can change in the first year. In addition to that, our babies grow, go through some pretty consistent growth spurts in the first year, and with growth spurts come changes in sleep and feeding. So if you're breastfeeding, you may find that during these growth spurts, your baby is wanting to nurse a lot. And you may think, oh, I'm not making enough milk, or my baby's not getting enough, and that's just not the case. These growth spurts and this constant nursing 
A is because they're saying during this growth spurt, I'm trying to increase your milk supply and I'm trying to get more because my body is utilizing it more quickly. Um, and so it's kind of nature taking its course, right? It's saying, hey, if I nurse more frequently for a couple of days, you might start making three ounces instead of two and a half ounces because your body knows to make more and then we're good now. Or they may be nursing more frequently or wanting to eat more frequently because they're gonna be sleeping longer stretches and they need to have this store of milk. Um, in addition, they may have sleep disruptions during this time too. Because at three months, maybe the sleep disruption is that they're starting to roll over, they're growing, they're getting stronger, and they start practicing that skill in their sleep. At six months, they may be sitting up and wanting to practice that skill in their sleep. Um, so it's important to know that they're coming so we can anticipate them instead of being caught off guard and frustrated. A great tool to help us with growth spurts is the Wonder Weeks app. Um, I think this is fantastic for letting us know not only that those growth spurts are coming and a disruption in sleep may be headed our way for a couple of days, um, but also the why behind it. What is your child learning? What brain development is happening in this wonder week to let us know kind of why a disruption might be happening? Because when there's a why, we're always less frustrated. We always need the why. Um, and if we continue to have a consistent routine, the disruption will only last a couple of days. It won't throw us completely off schedule. Number six is to then adjust our baby's routine to suit their age. So we know that a lot happens in the first year and what a six week old needs is very different than what a six month old needs, which is very different than what a 12 month old needs. So it's important that we're adjusting to suit the child's age. So that is why I keep talking about a routine versus a schedule. A routine is a set of things that happen pretty consistently um, and not a set time schedule. Because what a newborn needs is different than what a 12 month old needs, but within their routines of going to sleep, they need the same things. So here is a look at typical infant sleep patterns. Um, and this is something that I think is a great printable to have to post somewhere um, as a parent, but also as a childcare provider. So those two on here who are co-teachers, um, I think is really important to have this available for your classroom. Um, I will send out the slides after, so don't feel like you have to screenshot it or anything, which I should have probably said at the beginning, um, but we'll also send out a recording of this as well. So if you have a loved one that wasn't able to attend, um, you can share it with them too. Um, so what I want to highlight here is really the time between naps. Um, so what we call this is awake windows. So this is the amount of time that my baby is typically awake before I need to offer another nap. So let's take a two month old for an example. Their awake window is two hours. So I know if my baby has been awake for about two hours that I need to offer a nap again and I need to be looking for those early sleep cues. Um, this helps me kind of tune in to what to look for. If I'm not aware that my baby only is awake for about two hours before they need another nap, then I might not be as clued in or tuned in to those sleep cues. Same with the nine month old, their awake window is four hours. So they're going a lot longer between naps, which means that they're gonna be napping less during the day. And those naps are probably a lot more consistent in nature than they were when our baby was two months old. Similarly with infant feeding patterns, um, so a two month old breastfed baby is taking about two to five ounces every hour and a half to three hours. Our 12 month old is still taking two to five ounces every hour and a half to three hours because that's kind of what breastfed babies do. They don't typically increase the amount of ounces that they're drinking um, or the time in between feedings because the fat in the milk changes as baby gets older. Formula doesn't do that. Um, so a two month old is taking four ounces every four hours. Babies usually take about an ounce an hour when it comes to formula. 
And then by 12 months, they're taking probably eight ounces um, and maybe drinking four times a day, morning, twice during the day, and then once before bed. So two very, very, very different eaters. So it's important to know which baby you have um, and what is typical. A newborn is six week old is feeding at 10 to 12, if not more times a day. So there is a lot of feeding happening, but they're only getting a little bit of milk. Um, so they need it more, more frequently. I think that's also important for your child care providers who are on here is to let them know if your baby is breast or bottle fed, and if your baby is having a combination of breast milk and formula, um, they typically act as if a breast milk baby and not a formula fed baby. Um, so that they know that routines look different um, and expectations look different. So let's put this all together because I promise this is not as overwhelming as it may seem in two slides. Um, but we take Charlie, he's four months old, he sleeps about 14 to 16 hours a day with nine to 10 of that happening at night. That does not mean it's necessarily happening in one long stretch. He's taking about three naps a day and his awake window is about two hours. He is also nursing two to five ounces every hour and a half to three hours. So I know that Charlie is gonna wake up around seven. He's gonna nurse a couple of times and then go down for a nap around nine because his awake window is two hours. If he woke up at eight, then obviously that nap would not still be at nine, it would be at 10 um, because of the two hour awake window. So that's the difference between a routine and a schedule. Wakes up, nurses a few times, goes back for another nap. Wakes up, nurses a couple of times, goes back for a little evening cat nap. Obviously during the awake time, we're playing and we're stimulating with him because he's awake for two hours, an hour and a half of that probably that he's not eating. Um, so that's a great opportunity for playing, for going on a ride, a stroller walk, um, working on tummy time, all of that. And then because he is a four month old breastfed baby, I may expect him to cluster nurse in the evenings, which means he may want to nurse more frequently before bedtime. Um, and then bedtime somewhere between seven and 7.30, waking possibly one to two times at night for feedings. Um, so that is what I would expect a routine for Charlie at four months to look like. As Charlie gets older, that routine's going to fluctuate because his awake window is going to stretch a little bit longer. So his naps may, differ. As he gets older, he may be nursing less often, especially as we're offering solids. Also, an early bedtime is really, really important. And for working parents, this can be really challenging. There were days based on my son and daughter's last awake time from their nap at school, that bedtime was at 6.30. And that was really, really, really hard when all I wanted to do was spend time with my baby. I was home for maybe an hour and it was their bedtime. But I knew that that routine was super important and that awake window was super important and that the next day I would be able to spend more time with them. And I had to cherish that one hour that I had with them and cherish that morning time with them because I knew that they needed to go to sleep. It was about their routine and what their body needed and not about me. And I think that that was something very, very hard to face as, as a parent and something that can be really challenging, especially when you're working and you're not getting as much time that you may want to keep your baby awake longer um, into the night so that you can spend more time with them, but it's just not conducive for their overall health and their overall routine and well-being, um, and that's hard. So the last tip, tip number seven, is to not expect perfection. Your baby's routine won't always run like clockwork. Um, although babies like consistency, changes are gonna happen from day to day and as baby grows. Uh, sometimes, for whatever reason, your baby's just gonna wanna skip a nap, have an extra feed or wake up early, um, sometimes at 4 a.m. and it is what it is. Um, it, they could just be a little off one day. It could be linked to a new tooth or a minor illness or a cold. It could be linked to a holiday or a sibling, whatever it may be. 
those things should not disrupt your routine too much as long as you're continuing to keep consistency. Just pick back up and go with the flow. Um, but enjoy every single moment that you have with your baby. And you're not alone. Every parent faces the same challenges. An occasional break shouldn't cause too much disruption to your baby's routine. And these are great opportunities to connect with other parents to say, hey, we're going through the six month growth spurt. How is that going for you? Or, oh, we just cut the first tooth and it's been torture. How is the first tooth been for you? Um, my son, I always knew when a tooth was coming in. My daughter, I never knew. And she would cut all four at the same time. So she got all four of her front teeth at the same time, all four molars at the same time. And I had no clue. Um, with my son, I knew for weeks that they were coming in. So every baby is different. They're gonna approach things differently. But in the whole grand scheme of parenting, you're not alone and you have a support system.